Uh, we're picking up on page 363. This is Uh, yeah, 363 and 428 in the 10th edition, <clears throat> where we left off at the very end of class the other day was they drive by the um, old family burial ground, the grandmother called it, and we're told it's got five or six graves, okay? I mentioned there are six people in the car. This is a little bit of foreshadowing on O'Connor's part. Um, they keep driving on, turn the page, and they stop at the tower for barbecue, apparently for lunch. And the proprietor, the owner of the tower, is a guy named Red Sammy, Red Sammy Butts, okay? And they pull up, he's lying on the ground, underneath the car, uh, working on it. The children, the family go inside, they sit down at a table, and the mother, Puts money in the jukebox, plays the Tennessee Waltz. She asked Bailey if he would like to dance, and he just glares at her. Okay. Um, we're told exact middle of the page almost. He didn't have a naturally sunny disposition like she did, and trips made him nervous. A little bit of foreshadowing, okay, his nervousness. Um, The children step up to the counter, and Red Sammy's wife is there. And she sees June Star and says, Ain't she cute? Would you like to come be my little girl? June Star, no, I certainly wouldn't. Wouldn't live in a broken down place like this for a million bucks. And she runs back to the table where her parents are. And the Red Sammy's wife again says, Ain't she cute? What does she mean the second time? Yeah, she's being sarcastic. The first time she means, oh, what a cute little girl. Second time she means, you dirty, rotten little itch, you know, kind of a thing. Grandma, aren't you ashamed? You shouldn't talk to one, adults <laughs> like that, and two, strangers, you know. So Red Sam comes in. We get the description. His khaki trousers reached just to his hip bones and his stomach hung over them like a sack of meal swaying under his shirt. Kind of disgusting. He sits down at a table nearby and says, you can't win. These days, you don't know who to trust. Ain't that the truth? The grandmother, people are certainly not nice like they used to be. What does she mean, like they used to be? Louder? Back in her time, back in the good old days. Okay? And Red Sammy explains without saying, here's why I'm saying that, but he gives us the context for his saying, you, you can't trust anybody. Two fellers came in here last week driving a Chrysler. Beat up old car. But it's a good one. These boys looked all right to me. Said they worked at the bill. You know I let them fellas charge the gas they bought. Now why did I do that? So what does he mean he let them charge the gas? This is not credit cards. He let them fill up their car on the basis of what? How they looked. He said they seemed like decent fellas. They didn't pay him. He let them charge, meaning he let them fill up and agreed to come back later and pay him. Okay? They came in here last week. What's the implication? They haven't shown up. They didn't come back and pay him for the gas that they charged. Why did I do that? Grandmother, because you're a good man. Now, what does she mean by that? Does she mean literally, ontologically, that's a you know, philosophical term that means on the basis of existence, that he is an, an innately good person? Not necessarily. It means he's trusting, he's kind, he's compassionate. He's all those things Abner Snopes is not. Put it that way, all right? 
Red Sam. Yes, I suppose so. His wife brings the orders out. And she says, it is in a soul in this green world of gods that you can trust. And I don't count nobody out of that. Nobody. Looking at her husband. You, you get the impression there's some tension in this marriage. Something's maybe not quite right. And notice when Bailey's wife asks him to dance, he just glares at her. There's something maybe not quite right in that marriage or relationship. Top of 365, the grandmother asks Red Sam, did you read about that criminal, the misfit that's escaped? His wife replies, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if he didn't take this place right here. If he hears about being here, I wouldn't be none surprised to him. If he hears his two cents of cash, I wouldn't be tall surprised. Notice, three times she says she wouldn't be surprised. I'm not saying this is literally the case, but it's almost like she wants the misfit to show up. I mean, she she's, seems so emphatic about, you know, her belief that he's going to. Sam, that'll do. That's a polite way of saying, it. shut it. <laughs> Go bring these people their Coca-Colas. And Red Sam gives us the title of the story. A good man is hard to find. Everything is getting terrible. I remember the day you could go off and leave your screen door unlatched. Not no more. Why not? Because people will break in and rob your blind. When is the story set? I mean, I've suggested it's probably set about the time that it was published, 1953. We know it's after World War II. Okay. Do you really think somewhere in Middlesville, Georgia, you couldn't go off and leave your door, your screen door unlatched in 1953? I, I don't think that's true. Okay. The wife's family, who lives in Georgia, still, I'm sure, leaves doors unlocked. All right. What does he mean everything is getting terrible? Is it because somebody's escaped from the state penitentiary? Is he talking about economics? Inflation's up, jobs are down, you know, all that kind of stuff? Not necessarily. That's what all of this stuff is about. So let me pause. When the 20th century began, when 1899 rolled over to 1900, there was a belief among Western nations, Western Europe, the United States, etc., okay, that the next century would be wonderful, that things would really change for the better, that the Industrial Revolution and the rise of a scientific outlook on life would end world hunger, world poverty, racism, prejudice, war, all those things. In fact, it was claimed, and there was a publication named, it would be the Christian century. Not that everybody would fall on their knees and bow and worship Jesus, but that the, the social gospel aspect of Christianity, the be nice to each other, follow the golden rule, that kind of thing, okay, that would become the dominant operating philosophy of at least the Western world, right? And it was also called, next century, the progressive century. Why? Progress would keep on rolling along. I mean, look at the difference in the Western world from 1800 to 1899. People traveled in 1800 by horseback, largely, or foot, or maybe stagecoach. By 1899, we have the locomotive. Okay, We do have electric engines. We do have automobiles. They haven't been popularized because of Henry Ford's inventing the assembly line. That didn't happen until the early 20th century. But they are ex in existence. All right? I mean, Alexander Graham Bell has invented the telephone. We've got the telegraph. There's mass communication, all that stuff. And then what happens? 
Before that, 1914, the war to end all wars occurs. Why? Because some crazy guy shoots an Archduke in Serbia, kills Archduke Ferdinand. And, you know, think of Archduke Ferdinand as merely being one of a dominoes. And he hits, he's killed. And the dominoes start falling. Why? Because the Austro-Hungarian Empire has alliances. Germany's brought in. And who are the rulers of all of these empires? Russia, England, Germany. They're cousins. They're all children of Queen Victoria. And it's like, well, I'm not going to let, you know, so-and-so do something, you know, etc. And World War I begins... It never should have happened. It literally never should have happened. And it becomes this huge conflagration. What does it also become called? So it's the war to end all wars. It's the Great War. And then it's called later World War I. Why? Because most of the nations of the world are involved. Are there some that aren't? Yeah, there's a lot that aren't. Why? Because it's way over there in Europe. And they're way down here somewhere else, you know. Parts of Asia, parts of Africa aren't involved. A lot of Africa is. Parts of South America aren't involved, okay? So, that happens. Then what happens? Well, 12 years after World War I, we get the beginning of the Great Depression. What stops the Great Depression? It's not FDR. You've been lied to if you've been taught in history classes. FDR ended the Great Depression. What ended it? World War II. That's what ended it. It ended in Germany because Hitler started putting everybody to work doing what? Not slaughtering Jews. That doesn't happen. Sort of happened until the end of the 1930s. Yeah, mid to late 1930s. He puts him to work building his military machine. He starts rearming Germany, going totally against the Treaty of Versailles, by the way. Okay? But nobody stopped him. If he'd been stopped in the 1930s, there would have been no Second World War. Okay? So what ends it? The Second World War. Why? Because every Western country has got to start producing tanks and planes and bullets and bombs. You put people to work. And you start printing massive amounts of money. Yeah, depression ends, right? World War II ends 1945 because of the bombing of the two bombs in Japan. Okay. Well, it ends in the Asian theater, the Pacific theater. It's ended in Germany in May. What happens within five years? You get what's called the Korean conflict. The United States never declared war. We were involved in a Korean conflict. Guess what? We still are. The conflict hasn't literally ended. We are in an armistice. All right? By the end of that decade, that's the 1950s, the United States is now involved in another place in Asia. Where? Vietnam. We are not involved actively shooting, but we are providing um, military advice to the French who are involved in actively shooting. And it's in the early 1960s when we do involve ourselves actually shooting. And we get involved from like 1962 to 1975 or so. All right? So much for the progressive Christian century. And you know, and I don't haven't even mentioned what happens in you know Russia. 60 to 100 million dead has nothing to do with World War II. It has everything to do with Stalin. Okay? So what else happens? The late 19th century, kind of beginning middle of the 19th century, but late 19th century. You get the rise of a philosophical outlook on life called nihilism. 
Anybody know who, who's the founder of that? A guy named Friedrich Nietzsche, right? Who died from insanity, by the way. And Nietzsche essentially said, essentially taught, this is bare bones, wildly oversimplifying. There is no meaning to life. None. Absolutely none. And anybody who says there is meaning to life is lying to you. Nietzsche said, God is dead, therefore everything is possible. Guess who really liked Nietzsche's ideology? Hitler. He combined Nietzsche's ideology with this idea, this racist idea of the... I didn't put it up for my first class. The Ubermensch. The Superman. Okay. Germans. Good Aryans. Tall, blonde, blue-eyed, white, the whole nine yards. Even though every one of those except for white does not describe Hitler. He was short, dark-haired. Okay. He thought he would build the super race, you know. Um, so that's, you know, that's where nihilism comes from, comes from Nietzsche. But then you also have this idea of Christian existentialism, which comes from a Danish philosopher slash theologian named Soren Kierkegaard. And existentialism was this belief that also life is kind of without meaning unless you give it meaning. And you give it meaning by making every day meaningful. But for Kierkegaard, because he's a theologian, he's Lutheran, that's got to be related to God somehow. So you live every moment, so to speak, for God. And you do that by taking a leap of faith. Every day, everything you do becomes a leap of faith. Why? Because you can't know. You can't know. Like, I know that this marker in my hand exists. How do I know that it exists? Somebody give me the easy answer. I can see it. Why else? I, it's in my hand. It's, it's not a phantom. Okay? Here, try holding God in your hand. Try seeing God with these eyes. You can't do it, right? So it's a belief. It's a blind leap of faith kind of thing. All right? So he comes up with this idea of Christian existentialism. Your existence has got to be, you know, lived out, proved, etc. Well, in the mid-30s and 40s, another kind of existentialism comes into play. And it's a secular slash atheist set, uh, existentialism. And its two major proponents are Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Camus, or Albert Camus. Okay? Sartre wrote a bunch of plays and short stories and essays and stuff. Camus wrote novels in a couple of plays and essays and such. Probably Sartre's most famous one, play at least, would be No Exit, in which he kind of describes people as living in a box, and you can't escape the box. You're always in that box, okay? Even though these two people are separated by this desk, and notice I'm standing between them, and I can do my hands like this, and I could touch each of them if I wanted to. Really, there's a wall separating them. In fact, all of us have a box right around us. Not a literal box. It's a metaphorical box. And we can never get outside that box. And according to this belief, we are all, therefore, totally isolated, totally alienated from everybody else. And we can never truly connect. Okay. What does that do for everything you think about life? Can you, you know, this represents love in a sense. Married 37 years. Can you have love if you can never really connect? No, you can't. All right? That, by the way, is probably why in the late 60s, early 70s, AT&T or Bell Telephone, whatever the, I don't remember what it was called then, came out with a telephone commercial. 
Reach out and touch someone via the phone. Can you literally, via the phone, reach out and... No, you can't. But voices can be heard. It was a means of breaking down those barriers, right? So that was kind of Camus. Uh, sorry, Camus was probably most famous for popularizing what's called the myth of Sisyphus. Anybody know who Sisyphus was? Yeah, he got pushed forward up the hill. Because he did something that the, the Greek gods didn't like, they condemned him for all eternity to push a rock up a hill. And just when he would get to the lip of the top of the hill, the rock rolls over him back down to the bottom. And you've got to trudge back down to the bottom and start pushing that damn rock back up that hill. And he does this for all eternity. Why? What's the significance for here and now? This is your life. Every morning you wake up and you've got to push a rock up a hill. Not a literal rock. What's the rock? Whatever it is you do, day in and day out. In the 1960s, that myth kind of gets transformed into a phrase, the rat race, popularized by psychology experiments, where you take rats, or a rat, and you put it in a maze, or you take several rats, put them in a maze, and you have cheese at the end of the maze. What's that become emblematic of our lives? Because we began to see in the late 60s, throughout the 70s, TV commercials. There was a Miller commercial, I think it was. Go for the gusto. Okay. Which implied, you only live once. In fact, it began, you only live once. Go for the gusto. Get what you can. You might have seen, you know, bumper sticker. He who dies with the most toys wins. There's another one, life's a beach. Well, according to this kind of existentialism, change the vowel in that second bumper sticker, life's a beach. Change the vowel in beach. Life's a bitch. And then you die. Makes you just wake up with a smile on your face, right? Rip, roaring, ready to go, tackle the new day, achieve all these great goals. No. Makes you get up in the morning and think what? Should I grab the loaded revolver off the desk and swallow it and go? Because nihilism and this say there is no point. There's, there's no reason for why you exist. So, Sartre and Camus said it, because they don't want people going around killing themselves. You have to validate or authenticate your existence. You have to make meaning for your life. How do you do that? Any guesses? Louder? How, do, how would a dream Make your life meaningful. What do you mean by dream? You mean literal, like no, no, sleeping no, 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 dreams? No, no. Okay. As in, like, I want to be Okay. I have a dream of, like, I want to be the best lawyer in whatever. You know, a bucket list, maybe. Or I want to be the best lawyer in the world. Or I want to be the, you know, richest person in the world, you know. Or start knocking off Bezos and Elon Musk, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Those are ways. Uh, you know, Queen Elizabeth died yesterday. All these tributes come out, you know, she was a rock, she was solid, she blah, 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 okay? A lot of people, you know, horrible, rotten, nasty people are like, yeah, but she was a colonial imperialist. And she wasn't. She saw the empire essentially dissolve. I mean, when she became queen, the, Ro the Roman Empire, the British Empire, the, the saying about it, the sun never set on it. I mean, there were like 47 nations under the empire. 
By the time she died, there's only 14 left in the, what's called the Commonwealth. And the British monarch has no, no rule, no control. We just sit aside, you know, open charities and do things like that. Okay? But she was known for her charitable giving, for example. So one way you could validate your existence is by doing good things. Anybody know who died? Let's see, today's the ninth. On September 5th, 1997, 25 years ago, two people died on the same day, both very famous. Prince Charles's, sorry, King Charles's, he's now king, third, uh, excuse me, first wife, Princess Diana, okay, Mother Teresa of Calcutta. How were they different? Well, one was a princess, and one committed her entire life to helping the poorest of the poor, the lowest of the low, the literal, in Indian society, outcasts. See, we don't have outcasts in the United States. Not literal outcasts. They have people who are outside the caste system. They are like dirt to be trodden. She made it her mission in life to help those people. Nobody else would. That's one way you could validate your existence. Another way you could is like doing, I'm not going to name him, the guy in Memphis the other day. And go around and start killing people. Or like the kid in Uvalde, Texas, over the summer. Take the old lady, help her across the street, or push her in front of the oncoming traffic. Why? How does that validate your existence? People know you lived. <laughs> right? I mean, there, are, there will be people in Memphis from two days ago till the end of their lives who will know this guy lived. Why? Because he took away their loved ones. Okay? So that's part of all of this. This reaches its apex in the 1950s. This belief system, this existentialism, really reaches its height. This, you know, life means, pardon my French, shit. That's it. Okay? Look at what Red Sammy says. Again. Uh, everything is getting terrible. Well, in 1953, in the United States, you could say, economically speaking, that's not true. We, we were kind of starting to do pretty well. I mean, just a year or two later, a couple of years later, Eisenhower would start the interstate highway system. I-40, I-24, I-75, I-95, I-80. He did that for one reason, by the way. Anybody know what it was? So that if there ever was a military situation in the United States where war material needed to be moved quickly, it could happen. See, when he got to Europe, when after the D-Day invasion, he realized there are no good roads here. Let's build some good, wide roads that go from point A to point B so you can go quickly. Okay, so everything is getting terrible. I remember the day you could go off and leave your screen door. Who does a grandmother blame the problems of the world or, to be more specific, the problems of the United States on? Europe. Why Europe? What's the United States doing in Europe in the 1950s, early 1950s? Marshall Plan begins in 1948, I believe. Okay, General Marshall's idea of we need to rebuild. Who were they rebuilding? I mean, yeah, France, you know, an ally. Who else? Germany, Italy. We were spending our hard-earned dollars rebuilding the people who started the war. Same thing with Japan. Okay. She says they think like we're made out of money. Have, I shouldn't go there. What the hell? 
Get online and look at how much money we, metaphorically, money, stuff worth money, we have sent to Ukraine just in the last six months. Uh, we're talking probably, I bet we're getting close to half a trillion dollars. Half a trillion dollars. Biden just, you know, announced the other day another 13 billion. It's like pulling a dollar out of my wallet. It, 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 it's funny money now. It's monopoly money. It doesn't count anymore. When you're just, sure, have, you know, if I were to bring in monopoly money and say, have 500, you'd think what? It's not real money. It's kind of what we're, almost the point we're getting at, okay? So, they leave. They keep driving. And as they drive, what does the grandmother tell them about? She remembers a plantation house from her childhood, or excuse me, from her youth. Okay? And she tells this story about the plantation house and what did it have in it? A secret passage, a secret compartment. And what was in that secret compartment? Silver. And the children say, hey, let's find it. Let's go see if we can find it. And she says, I saw the dirt road that you turned down to go to just about a mile back. And the children go, ape, you know what crazy. So John Wesley's kicking and punching the back of the seat that his father is sitting in, which means he's kicking and punching his father in the back. June stars hanging over her mother's shoulder, probably between mom and dad, yelling at the top of her lungs. And Bailey, bottom of 365. All right, will you all shut up? Just shut up. If you don't shut up, we won't go anywhere. What's this tell us about Bailey? Ooh, short fuse, man. He's... Grandmother, it would be very educational for them. How would it be educational? Are they going to study the architecture of the plantation and how it was built? No. What are they talking about doing? Think of this in a legal context. Burglary. Burglary. Breaking and entering. And Bailey's like, okay, we'll do this, but we're not going to spend long. Anyway. We can't go in anyways. 366. You don't know who lives there. John Wesley. While you talk to the people in front, I'll run around and get in a window. Mid-1950s, Nowheresville, Georgia. What's going to happen to an eight-year-old boy who's caught sneaking in a window in Bubba's house? He's, this is utter stupidity. Okay? The mother says, we'll all stay in the car. So if they're all going to stay in the car, why turn around to begin with? So they turn around the dirt road, and we're told the road is hilly, it's got Portions of it kind of missing from rainstorms and such. And how is Bailey driving down this road? Is he driving slowly and carefully? No, we're told racing. So it comes around a turn, loses control. Does he lose control because of his driving? No. What causes him to lose control? What causes the cat to lose control? On the side road of the grandmother remembers. <gasps> no, that house was in Tennessee. It's not here. And when she does that, she jumps. She's kind of startled by the memory. Her feet kick. She knocks the lid off the basket that the cat is in. The cat jumps onto Bailey's back and sho shoulder and neck, claws out, and he <clears throat> turns. They flip over, and they end up. The car's here. And most of them end up here. Not immediately, they just, they end up here, okay? What does Bailey do with the cat once the car stops? He pulls it off with both hands, we're told, and does what? Sorry for you cat lovers. He throws it out the window, 
against a pine tree. Probably killing it, if not instantaneously, it's going to die shortly, shortly thereafter from a broken back. Well, what's, what's the state of the others? The children are thrown to the floor, and their mother, clutching the baby, is thrown out the door onto the ground. Why are the children thrown to the floor? Why is the mother out the door and on the ground? Why is the grandmother under the dashboard? What are none of them wearing? Why? They didn't have them yet. Okay? Children yell, we've had an accident. Bailey throws the cat. The grandmother, Bailey gets out of the car, starts looking for his wife. She's sitting against the side of the red gutted ditch that's down here. She's sitting here. Why is the ditch described as red gutted? Color is Georgia clay. It's red. Any symbolism going on here? Well, yeah. <laughs> and notice what the description we get about her. Holding the screaming baby but she only had a cut down her face and a broken shoulder. Now, you're not required to, but click on the YouTube link that I posted um, on D2L of Flannery O'Connor reading this. Because she reads it very calmly, and she reads it in her southern Georgia drawl, and she reads it very humorously. It is meant to be humorous. All the serious stuff is kind of belied by that humor. It is rather funny how she reads it. Okay, Only a broken shoulder. Anybody in here ever have a broken shoulder before? Fun? Pleasure? Pleasant? No. I think I mentioned in here, you know, 2010, I stepped out my garage door and put some trash in a trash can. And there was snow on the ground, and I was not thinking. And underneath that snow was like a sheet of ice. And I stepped, and my foot just like a Bugs Bunny cartoon on a banana peel. And I broke my fall like this, and I severed all of my rotator cuff. That's all the tendons connecting this part of my body with this part of my body. Ripped. Pain. Pain like you could never imagine. Take that back. Ladies, any of you have children? You'll, you won't have to imagine. My wife says, oh yeah, I can imagine that being, okay? Children scream again. We had an accident in June Star. Wonderful, delightful little girl. But nobody's killed looking at her grandmother as she gets out of the car. Okay, that's meant to be humorous. Why? Damn, if only she died. I think it was in this class, the other, either this class or my Tuesday, Thursday class. I made a joke, <laughs> and I shouldn't have made it. it was, I was talking about Charles and Queen Elizabeth. I said, you know, and the old bat just won't die. Literally, two days later, you know, she goes to the great beyond. And the mother says, the children's mother, not the old lady, maybe a car will come along. So the road's about 10 feet up. They're all now down here. Road, the car's up here sitting on the road. They can see trees. When they look up here, they can see trees here and trees here. But looking kind of down the gulch, as it were, they can see the road on other parts of the hills. And they see a car slowly make it. And it stops above them behind their car. And the grandmother says, middle of 367, uh, the gentleman gets out of the car, says, I see you all had a little spill. She said, we turned over twice. Once. Only once. We've seen it happen. Try their car and see what run, Hiram. He said quietly to a boy with a gray hat. John Wesley notices. What you got that gun for? What you gonna do with that gun? Because 
The gentleman with the glasses and the receding gray hair, no shirt on, he's got a gun. Hiram has a gun. And the other male, Bobby Lee, has a gun. And he says to the children's mother, Bailey's wife, would you mind calling them children to sit down by you? Children make me nervous. I want all you to sit down right together there. Bailey, uh, we're in a predicament. Grandmother, I, we're told she kind of feels like she knows who this is. And now, what does she do? She blurts out, you're the misfit. Yes, sir. It would have been better for all of you, lady, if you hadn't have recognized me. Why? And now I'm going to have to kill you. <laughs> if she hadn't have recognized him, what's he implying? They would have survived. But since she has, if they let him live, she can go tell the police. Bailey turns his head, yells something at his mother that isn't printed, but what do we know about what he yells at his mother? Two things. It makes her cry. Oh, he made mama cry. And it makes the misfit do what? He blushes. So what did Bailey say? If he can make a hardened killer blush. I mean, this had to be some string of obscenities, right? And he says... I don't reckon he meant to talk to you that way. What does she say? You wouldn't shoot a lady. Is she talking about her daughter-in-law? Two words. Hell no. <laughs> She's talking about herself. I'd hate to have to. I know you're a good man. You don't look a bit like you have common blood. I know you must come from nice. What does she mean, common blood? And then later, nice people. What did she want everyone to know about her if they had an accident and she was found dead on the side of the road? It's the reason why she dresses the way she does for this trip. That she was a lady. What's meant by a lady? A proper woman. A woman of good birth, a woman of good standing. Not the kind of people Mother Teresa took care of. Common means low, base. Think Snopes. Think the Snopes family. Common. They're sharecroppers, dirt poor. She's not one of them. Okay? That's what she means by when she says, I know you must come from nice people. You must come from, from good middle class people. Good church going people. Yes, him, he says, finest people in the world. God never made a finer woman than my mother. Daddy's heart was pure gold. And he says, watch him, Bobby Lee. You know, they make, they make me nervous, them children. And he looks up. Why does he look up? Ain't no sun in the sky. Ain't no clouds either. So what do you see? You're down here and you look up. Just blue sky. Notice, to one side, green trees. To the other side, green trees. And above, blue sky. This is symbolism. Where can you, let's say, lie on your back, and look and see kind of greenish, greenish, and blue up here. How about water? If you're under the water and you look up, okay, it's bluish, right? But if you look this direction, let's say you're in a pond or in a lake, you look this direction, is it still blue? It's green. If you look this direction, it's green. Or if you're in the ocean, same thing. But if you look above, you're going to see blue. Why? I think there's baptism imagery. I think, I'm not sure. But if it is, what's the imagery? 
If you know anything about the Christian ritual of baptism, what happens in it? It's got kind of two parts, right? If you're Southern Baptist, I'm not. If you're Southern Baptist, how does baptism happen? You know, in the Presbyterian church, it used to be Presbyterian, it was enough for some guy to just come up and you know, sprinkle some water. You're Catholic, you know, just sprinkle a little water. It's good. You know, Jesus washes you all the way. No, in a good Baptist church, good think, you know, revival tent, you know, meeting, you go all the way under and then up. Why all the way under? What's happening? What's being washed away? Sin, because what's happening there? It's death. And then you're brought back up. You're brought back to life. It's death, crucifixion, and resurrection. The only difference between the ritual and here is it's death. Because what's going to happen? Hiram, take that daddy and his his little boy over yonder to those woods. Have a word with him. What's the word? Bobby Lee, take that mama and, and her little girl and that baby over with them, with you. And what happens? Three shots. Okay. Bottom of 368. Notice what Bailey says as he's leaving. I'll be back in a minute, Mama. Wait on me. Who's Mama? Is this the children's mother? Or is this Bailey's mother? It's pretty clear it's Bailey's mother. What's the most important relationship to Bailey? I mean, if you're getting ready to die and your family's around you, including your mother and your wife or husband and kids, and the last person you speak to is your mother, what does it mean to your own family? I can tell you right now, if I were in this situation and I said something to my mother, my wife would be, can I borrow that gun? I'll shoot the bastard myself. I mean, if I'm not going to be the last one he speaks to on this side, you know, I'll stop him from talking forever. <laughs> okay. What does this tell us about Bailey? What kind of person is he? What phrase? Two words. Mama's boy. Mama's boy. She's lived with him all his life. He is under her thumb. That's why when she sits there, about missed it, he's just trying to channel her out. Okay? And we get the description, I didn't talk about it. As they're driving and she's talking about the plantation house and everything, we get the description of his jaw being set. I'm gonna kill the old bat myself. He's just Okay. Baby boy. And she says, I know you're a good man. Well, Red Sammy said, good man's hard to find. You're a good, what does she know about this guy? Before the, he's escaped from the state pen. Why was he there? You just read about the things he done. Murder? Probably at the least. And now she said, why is she saying you're a good man? This is meant ironic, right? This is meant to be humorous. There's nothing good about this guy. He's rotten. Okay? So, Hiram comes back, dragging the shirt, Bailey shirt that the man now puts on. And she asked him, middle of 369, do you ever pray? No. Gospel singer once. Been in the military, he says. Home and abroad, been married twice. Been an undertaker, been with the railroads, plowed mother earth, been in a tornado, seen a man burn alive. 
even seen a woman flogged. Notice everything, almost, I, I think we can maybe even infer some things from the military service. Everything he's just described. Is there anything positive? Anything beautiful? Anything uplifting? Anything wholesome? No. Never was a bad boy that I remember of, he says. Somewhere I'd done something wrong and I got sent to a penitentiary, buried alive. What's he mean by buried alive? Not literally. That box that I was talking about. Wall here, not a literal one, but he's enclosed. And that's why he says, turn to the right, it was a wall. Turn to the left, look up, look down. He says, I don't know what I did. I don't know what I did that merited this treatment. We're right smack in the middle of this. Why does life suck so badly? What have I done to deserve this stuff that's happening? I'll bet you in the moment, if they were aware of what was happening, in the moment before those four people who were shot in Memphis, shot and killed, not the others who lived, if they were aware, they probably were immediately wondering, why me? What have I done to deserve this? Maybe they put you in, but no, no, no. They had the papers. That is, they had proof. You must have stolen something. Didn't want anything. If <laughs> you don't be praying, Jesus would help you. You know, fall down on your knees and Jesus will make it all right. He goes, yep, that's right. Then why don't you do it? Why don't you pray? Don't want no help. I'm doing all right by myself. What's he mean? <clears throat> He's still above ground, right? He's still going around robbing, raping, pillaging, murdering. Okay, so Bobby Lee gives him the shirt. And now he asks the children's mother, Lady, would you and that little girl like to step off yonder? Bobby Lee and Hiram join your husband. Now, I didn't mention it, but when Bobby Lee helped the father up, notice he reaches him by the hand and gently pulls him up. He's an old man. And they go to help the children. Gene, sorry, don't touch me. They do the same with the mother. They help her up very kindly. Okay. Alone with the misfit now, the grandmother found she had lost her voice. Again, not a cloud in the sky nor any sun. Nothing around her but woods. Now, earlier the woods were described as like a gaping mouth. A gaping mouth implies hunger. Like these woods are going to swallow them up. So, he says, yep, Jesus throwing everything off balance. Page 370. Same case with him as with me. Except he hadn't committed any crime, and they could prove I had committed. One, because they had the papers. So it wasn't the same case, right? But they never showed me my papers. That is, they never showed me what it is I've done. Now, is he talking literally? I think yes. Is it also figurative or metaphorical? Yes. He says, so what I do is now I sign my crimes. It's like when there's a body left, he brings out the paint. The misfit. So everyone knows I did this. He's authenticating his existence. He's letting everybody know I am alive. There's a scream, pistol report. Does it seem right that one is punished a heap and another ain't punished at all? Why do some people suffer tremendously and others don't suffer at all? Jesus, you got good blood. Just pray to Jesus. You ought not shoot a lady. I'll give you all the money I can. And he says, there ain't an undertaker 
who never took no tip. Why? There ain't a body who never gave a tip to an undertaker. Because once you're dead, the undertaker gets everything. Clothes, any money left on you. Two more pistol reports. So, Cabbage Face Mom is dead. June Star is dead. And the little baby is dead. Jesus was the only one that ever raised the dead. Why does he say that? What happens just before that? Baby boy, baby boy, she cries out. Jesus was the only one that raised the dead. What's the context? Lazarus, come forth. He merely speaks. Lazarus comes out of the grave. She cries out, Bailey boy, Bailey boy, and he connects her with Jesus. You can't raise Jesus. You can't raise Bailey by calling him out. Jesus is the only one who did that. And he shouldn't have done it. Whoa. He thrown, thrown everything off balance. What's he mean? We'll pick up there on Monday. We'll finish you know, this little bit. Read the material for the introduction to drama. Couple, couple of things. There's a quiz that will be active in about two hours just on this short story, okay? And then there's an exam, the fiction exam, that will be active in about two hours, okay? The quiz is due Wednesday night at 11.59, so you have several days. Um, the exam is due Thursday night, all right? One little bit of advice, and I'm gonna post this also in D2L. Uh, you know, it says no notes, no book, no internet. Several of you, in the question that asked about how do authors uh, create characterization, had something like indirect or indirect, or direct or indirect, something else, that's a Google search. That's not in this book. Sorry, it, or let me rephrase that. Those aren't the bold-faced terms that are in the book that describe, okay? I didn't take any points off. I'm just warning you, right? If I see multiple things that are the same wrong answer, first thing I'll do is a simple Google search. And if that's the answer, um, I'm going to know that's exactly what happened, okay? All right. Uh, so Wednesday night for the quiz, Thursday night for the exam. We start the material on drama that's in the syllabus on Monday. Have a good weekend.